part of my checklist. So now we are recording and I'm going to go ahead and get started knowing that folks will filter in. And good morning. Good morning. It is Wednesday morning and you will find us echoing on Wednesdays. We have not had an echo since before spring break. So uh, Wednesdays, I feel like something is missing. So I'm feeling whole again now. Uh, we have echo voices this morning and on opposite Wednesdays, you'll find us uh, with Echo Ties, Echo Therapy and Educational Settings. So of course, uh, if you sign in today, we will automatically see your, um, your attendance and send you a, a certificate of contact hour credit for session 1.25 credit hours. Um, the handouts for this session and all of our sessions and all of our archived recordings, you can find at this, um, this location, the S'more newsletter. Um, you will also now be able to find the recordings on our, um, our webpage, our OTAP webpage. We put together a spreadsheet that has all of our sessions so that it's going to be easier for you to come in and search for something that may have been last fall or, um, or may have been even further back than that. But you'll be able to search by, uh, by presenter, uh, by possible topic. So we're excited about that. Um, we are also, of course, offering uh, contact hour credits for those who are viewing uh, from the recording. And so you will see uh, also on that page or where the archives are that we will put in a comprehension quiz um, that if you complete with 90% accuracy, you're going to be able to get the same credits as if you were viewing live. We're making this accessible. Um, we did, of course, the first thing I did was turn on closed captioning. As someone who has an educational uh, account, um, this is something that is currently free to uh, uh, in beta. It's rolling out to others. I know with the government account here uh, for Zoom uh, that it hasn't come into that environment yet, but it will. But closed captioning is one of those first things that you can turn on and should turn on uh, from a point of universal design. It's not just for persons with uh, hearing impairment. It helps uh, be way beyond that. So if you're in doubt, turn it on. Uh, Echo Voices, we're coming to the end of our second year and we couldn't be happier with the response that we've been getting and the presenters that we've brought forward. Um, we have, uh, we are planning our next year's uh, schedule, uh, starting to look at the progression and your voices are part of uh, our daily, our uh, regular Echo sessions, but we wanna hear from you too to know when you look at your implementation and your support of folks with uh, complex communication needs. Where are those places that a little bit of professional development could help? Well, you are probably experiencing things that others around the state are. We wanna give a spot where we can all come together, look at common barriers and find common uh, solutions. So please feel free to unmute yourself and, and be part of our conversations always. I'm Deb Fitzgibbons. It's a pleasure to be here and be coordinator of OTAP and also RSOI. Uh, typically, I don't have any um, uh, disclosures. Everything that I'm doing is my job. And uh, this really is part of that as well. But I feel compelled because our host today, um, or our guest today, special guest Phil Maycumber, um, has a new book out. And I was pleased, thrilled actually, to be uh, asked to be a contributing author. Um, so I have a chapter in Phil's book. So I really wanted to make sure that you knew that. And it's because we've had, we have a history. We've got, um, we've got practice and some research uh, moving through. And it's something that we are using as somewhat of a framework in some of our uh, professional development that starts with uh, color uh, uh, starts with routines and systems. So I was uh, compensated for writing the chapter. I am not receiving compensation um, ongoing uh, from the sale of this book. So I feel like I had to put that out there. 
um, Gail, uh, my uh, constant uh, co-facilitator in ECHO. Uh, we ECHO beyond our sessions because it's all um, it's things somehow tie together and, and we are finding ways to bring our conversations uh, district-wide, statewide and national. Gail, I see you're unmuted. Would you say a couple things for us? Yeah, good morning, everybody. I want to say first, congratulations to Phil and Deb for your new book. Um, it's, uh, it's really fun to see it out there. I know it's been in the works for a while. Um, my name's Gail Bowser. I work as a consultant to Echo Voices Project and the Echo Ties Project, and also uh, a Echo and Assistive Technology Project at the University of Wyoming. And that's only one of the many hats that I wear, but this is one of my favorites because it's great to get together with friends and acquaintances every Wednesday morning and um, learn something from somebody we wouldn't necessarily get to talk to otherwise. So welcome everybody and uh, look forward to seeing you at the next one. Great discussions come out of these, food for thought. So I'm just gonna give you a couple of reminders. <coughs> Excuse me, it's that time of year when I think the allergies are starting to come around and, and I can be kind of a mess, but um, I will bear on here and give you some announcements. Monday, April 19th, uh, this is really a function of our therapist support, but I wanna remind you uh, that we have a statewide town hall for therapists on uh, Monday, April the 19th from 1.30 to 3.30. Uh, we'll be sending a reminder out on that, but I'm really proud of the work that has come out of uh, these meetings. Um, it, uh, you'll see in the reminders coming out that uh, Gail uh, moved forward and, and saw a need for, uh, or was a need was brought forward that we needed guidance or needed more uh, talk around uh, kids who could not wear, um, wear masks. And so Gail, uh, uh, took a group of volunteer therapists and they put together some guidance that is rocking and, uh, and enrolling and, and ODE has recognized that and that work is just exemplary and we thank you for that. And that's the kind of um, thing that comes out of uh, these meetings is finding a need and bringing together the experts. Gail, did you have a comment on that? Well, I wanted to say that off, most often the town halls are really focused on occupational therapists and physical therapists, but um, that project actually also involves speech therapists from around the state of Oregon. So um, we will be talking about that at, at different points this spring and, and what is uh, up on the RSOI website now, but we're really proud of the work that we did and it's contributed to the field. So kudos to all the people that were involved in that project. Absolutely. And, and on top of that, you know, at, at our town hall meetings, the folks from AOTA, the American Occupational Therapy Association, have been joining. And the things that they're seeing that we talk about here in Oregon are rippling because they were thrilled to uh, when that document was shared with them as well. So this is how we break down barriers and uh, we get rid of silos, not to demolish them because Gail points out that as a farm girl, you never break down a silo. And I get that and I applaud that, but I also think we need to store something in silos other than information. We need to get that out and we need to be sharing it with everybody. So thank you for uh, that discussion, but it's such a meaningful way. And Linda joins us for those and we invite our licensing boards and, and the, the conversations that are coming out of this uh, are making a difference for everybody. So I can't say enough about that. Uh, our next Echo Voices session will be on the uh, 21st of April when we bring uh, transition planning for those with OGCOM. Dr. David McNaughton at Penn State is going to be talking and, and sharing uh, uh, with us on that topic. Um, we have, I want to mention that our next Echo uh, Tie session uh, coming up next Wednesday on the 14th is all about um, 
uh, eligibility uh, and criteria for that from our own um, physical therapist out of Portland uh, Public Schools and Erin um, Balbiani. So that's something that we have so much crossover in our topics you may wanna join. And of course we have our conference coming up April 26th through the 28th. Phil will be presenting a session there. Uh, Gail will be presenting as uh, as will I and talking about some of our work going on and, and great discussions. One of our keynotes on day two is going to be the uh, state gen ed uh, instructor innovation in digital technology. Uh, so for us uh, typically as AT people to be uh, cross um, conferencing with gen ed folks is a dream come true. So I look forward to the work that comes out of that. Uh, today though, we're gonna get to today because I couldn't be more excited to uh, welcome Phil Maycumber. Um, Phil is going to be talking to us today about the or art of oral presentation. Um, as I've already told you, we are have partnered in, in um, putting out guidance and uh, use of her framework. That was her first book, The Pact. I've known Phil for more than 10 years now. We um, started to get to know each other when I was in um, assistive technology in the special school district of St. Louis County. I supported five districts for uh, technology and Phil's um, PAC framework was introduced and took off, uh, makes sense. And so I will let Phil tell you more about that, but um, Phil is a, an author, but she also works face-to-face -face and supporting and coaching teams in implementation and integration and um, wonderful uh, strategies for classroom um, integration of uh, communication and um, multi-sensory um, uh, strategies. So without any further ado, Phil, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. I'm going to say welcome and um, go ahead and ask you to share your screen. Thank you so much, Deb. One of uh, the things that I am so excited about in Oregon is the trajectory since I have been involved uh, a few years ago, just to see how things are just expanding and continuing to make meaningful contributions and a difference. So it's very exciting to be a part of that journey for the small piece that I have. And when Deb talked with me about uh, doing a session this year, uh, I participated last year in your Echo Voices, which I love, love, love the name of, by the way, uh, that uh, we kind of honed in on oral presentation skills for AAC users. And I think also you are going to find today that uh, not only are these strategies appropriate for our AAC users, but also for students of all abilities. So I'm hoping that you can then share out some of this information with some of the teams that you support and other professionals you interact with on a regular basis. So Deb, I think I'm going to use this format in case I do need to navigate uh, back, if that's okay with you. That's perfectly okay. And as I started off, I said that we wanted to in, uh, invite interaction, but I didn't really clear that with you, Phil. I think that oh, you'd like to have yeah. interaction as you go along, but please clarify. Do you want us to wait or do you want us to ask questions when they come up? Ask questions as they come up. Okay, excellent. I, Yes, I've, I've been a part of uh, this format before. And one of the things that I found, at least in the nature of the work that I am doing, is whenever I present uh, a case study or multiple case studies, that I embed them throughout my presentation. And so uh, Deb was on board with that. And I was discussing that uh, with them prior to us kicking off here at 11 o'clock. And so I am going to be presenting four case studies today embedded throughout this presentation. So that lends itself to a really nice ebb and flow of a dialogue. So let's dive into the art of oral presentation skills for AAC users. You heard Deb reference that I am an author. 
Uh, I have my second book just came out called Every Child Can Learn that Deb has referenced. It's the kickoff of an ebook series on Amazon. And uh, the strategies that are in this presentation are aligned to my first book, which is on a teaching framework that is aligned to educational standards called the PACT. And those four steps you are going to see embedded throughout this presentation, and they will make sense to you clear as a bell today in uh, how we could teach and then place our students in leadership roles in the classroom. And those four steps are learn about, read about, write about, and talk about. So I always start with, boy, what are the challenges and the problems? And I, just to extend what Deb said, I know about these problems because I spend time in real schools with real kids that have challenges. And also, not only those that are enrolled in special ed services, but those that are at grade level and then also above grade level. And so we will find that many of the things that I mentioned before that we are going to uh, dive into today can be used with any student regardless of their ability. So let's look at some of the problems as it relates to placing students to lead from the front, as I call it. Because when we think of an oral presentation, if we were to close our eyes, we would think of a student either standing up or sitting in front of the room, imparting information or a project to their peers and any other adults that are in the room. But sometimes not everybody understands what is supposed to happen when they're a presenter and they can be very confused. Sometimes the audience is confused because they're not really sure about what the student is going to share or how they're going to share it, especially in the form of an AAC user. And then there's the, we all can feel this, whether we're children or adults, that sense of dread because oral presentations may not be your thing or that particular student's thing. And they might get choked up or get nervous and have wobbly legs and feel like they're going to throw up. So we want to make sure that we're making kids feel as strong as possible when we're placing them in roles to share what they know. Because if we teach them, what do you do with your hands? Are you talking too fast? How can you talk just right? What do you do with your nervousness? And how do you deal with being embarrassed if something falls off your wheelchair tray or if a slide doesn't work well in terms of transitioning and it went three ahead. How can we give our students the confidence and the success that they need? So we're not throwing them, jumping off a cliff into the middle of the lake, so to speak. Because I see that a lot in the different classrooms that I support. And the reason I see that is because oftentimes we don't step-by-step step teach how to be a presenter and an audience member. And we just put students in these roles. So the solution is to teach before you test. And we need to do both roles. We need to teach our students how to be a speaker or presenter, but we also need to teach the rest of the class how to be an audience member. And you know that's called in the speech language world, as we know, perspective taking. Now we do this even with little cutie patooties in preschool where, okay, so now let's switch. I'll be the teacher, right? You be the student. And we swap, I'll be the mommy, you be the daddy, right? So that kind of perspective taking, being able to look at something from a different angle is important. So I always start with, let's all be on the same page and teach students what an oral presentation is. 
And Deb knows this because we've worked together, like she said, for a long period of time. I only show real life examples in any of my professional development or manuscripts or articles. This is a real life example of how students ended up defining what an oral presentation was. They said an oral presentation was making a contribution by reporting on a topic they learned about, read about, and wrote about. And that made perfect sense to them because they couldn't present on something without having the knowledge base of it. And when we dove in deeper with our group of intensive needs students, they said they wanted to have a picture here to represent one of their presentation tools, not all of their presentation tools, but they presented on projects that they made paired with slide sets. And so this was an example of a slide set that they used. But they also learned that they needed to reflect on the skills we taught them to say thumbs up, did you smile at your audience? Thumbs up or down? Did you introduce yourself? Did you use a voice that was loud enough for everyone to hear you? And so on. And these were all skills that the students learned about. So when I first start teaching our students this, I always tie it to the brain. Deb knows I do a lot of work in the area of teaching executive functioning skills. And our students, with special needs and intellectual disabilities, as you will see, uh, my examples revolve around an executive functioning project. So I thought it would be nice, Deb, to like put both of these together in this session. So when teaching students to be a speaker or presenter, if you look at my video, we all would put our hands up and say, we're taking information out of our brain and giving it. And so all of our students and adults would do this to learn what that meant. And then being an audience member, we did it the opposite way. If we have a quiet body, our brain is in the group, we're looking at the speaker, we're listening, information will come into our brain. So these visual tags you will see throughout many of the instructional materials. Deb has heard me say this. In fact, she quoted this in her chapter on UDL uh, when I say that oftentimes when we need to teach a vocabulary word to students of any ability, we not only need to teach what it is, we need to teach what it is not. Like I just did this in a middle school uh, gen ed classroom with teaching oral presentation skills. And I'm going to grab right here my trusty director's clapper and every skill that we learn, we usually act out. We have a director, three, two, one, action, and we practice and learn our vocabulary. So as you might imagine, many students, including our students uh, with special needs, love being the spoof goof demonstrate what it's not because they get to do the silly behavior of being grumpy at the audience versus smiling at the audience. So I thought what I would do is share with you a set of vocabulary that you then could represent in whatever form you would like to, meaning with communication symbols, with real life images, with line drawings, with paired with video for these concepts. So here's a starter set of vocabulary for our students to learn about. Smile, volume of voice, meaning, and I'm going to speak loudly so I do not want to startle anyone listening to this recording or who is in this webinar. So not too soft and not too loud, just right. And then pacing your presentation, because this is extremely important with our AAC users and their devices, because sometimes their text to speech voice is at a rate that is a little bit too fast and we need to adjust that in the settings. So we teach 
make sure you're not talking too slow and not talking too fast, just right. So people could get information into their brain. You need to make sure you introduce yourself. So what does that mean? And let's practice that. And what is the topic? So, hello, my name is Phil, and I'm here to talk to you today about oral presentation skills. Or, my name is Lily, and I'm presenting my brain collage project. Okay. And then look and shift, because oftentimes our students have something they're showing in a presentation or looking at their device to generate their language. And we need to teach them that look and shift. So look, talk, share, shift. Look, talk, share, shift. And that's a real skill. We, that's something we should not assume that students know how to do. So that's a starter set for you to teach students how to be a speaker or a presenter. Here's a next level set because some students, this may be a little more abstract for them and you say, not yet, but other students, you might teach the entire set of vocabulary. Most students will present on facts. Say they're doing a presentation on the solar system. Their planet is the planet Earth. They're going to present informational text that they have researched on that project. But also it's important to teach what a personal opinion is and what a general opinion is. Personal opinion meaning what you think. General opinion meaning what other people may think about this. And then defining for your students, what are your presentation materials? You're going to use your device. You're going to use this pointer, meaning a pointer that they could put onto a whiteboard, projection screen, et cetera, smart board. You are going to present your 3D project or 2D project that you created and so on. What does it mean to summarize, wrap up as I'm doing in the video and have a closing comment? And for some of our students, it's simply thanking their audience for listening. But with other students, they might say, I hope today that you learned about things that are important to me and how I file them in my brain. And then what does it mean to set up a meaningful, successful question and answer period? And you're going to see some creative ways to do that. Now, the flip side of this is we need to make sure we have a captive audience, right? So when getting information, we want to make sure that our students are learning what does it mean to have a body still, look at the speaker, to wait. And that's hard for many of our kids that have impulse control issues, emotional regulation issues, and also flexible thinking issues. They need to have well, I just want to point out that it's also hard for many of the adults um, that I work with, that these skills that you're talking about, and, and one of the things I love is that they resonate across all age groups, across all topics, but I just want to point out that these are things and uh, that we should be teaching uh, even at the, uh, should I say the state level. Um, yeah, and Deb, that's a really good comment. I think one of the most meaningful exercises that I ever did uh, long ago when I started doing a significant amount of work, as you know, I'm a retired speech pathologist uh, in the area of executive functioning skills was to do a self-reflection on my own executive functioning skills. And I learned so much about myself because out of all of the executive functioning skills there are, you cannot be strong in all of them. <laughs> you have just like, that's learning profile, right? Like with our students, like you're stronger in others. These are okay. And these, whoa, pfft, not great. So I need to improve in that area. And then it was even more meaningful for me because I believe in harmony and relationships and relationships are important. I compared them to my husband's. And what I found to be so interesting 
And for those of you who have heard me speak, I speak a lot about my family and, uh, you know, and my relationships as examples. My husband excels in those executive functioning skills that I do not in. And I just find that so interesting in a partner. So I agree. I think that we need to uh, teach our students uh, these skills and also to uh, give reminders or sometimes teach them to adults. You know, looking at the speaker is important, but you also need to look at your presentation materials. It's not like you're locking gaze and never looking at anything else. And I think that's important for students to understand. And <clears throat> listening to facts. What does it mean to listen to facts? How do you give compliments? What is a compliment as an audience member? What does it mean to raise your hand? There is one uh, teacher that I work with. In fact, Deb, she was a contributor to In Every Child Can Learn, classroom teacher, Dulcie O'Hare. She wrote in her chapter about uh, teaching her students hand signals and boy, our meadow with Down syndrome was all over it. He would raise his hand like this with a, a V and that meant he wanted to be a volunteer. He raised his hand with a C and that meant he had a comment. He raised his hand with an I, that means I need information, I ask a question. And so raising your hand with signals, I think is really important to develop in any type of instructional setting even if you are doing this practice in a speech language session. <clears throat> when is it appropriate to give applause and when is it not? I worked with one student, she had the opposite of the problems I showed you. She was like little Lady Gaga. We could never get her to sit back down in her seat. She just wanted to stay up there forever. And she had a very unintelligible speech and had AAC supports. But she expected every time she shared something in her oral presentation, she would look at the audience and go like this, meaning clap for me, please. And so we needed to train the audience that when Michaela did that, they were not to respond and they were to sign more because she knew that. And they went like this, more, like I wanna learn more. And then, so she kept going. And as you would anticipate after she shared more, what do you think she did? And then finally, she realized applause were at the end, but we needed to teach and empower the audience to help her with that. You're also going to see how kids are going to use question supports in order to help our speakers answer questions in a way that they come from a place of strength. Now also other ideas uh, for teaching vocabulary is through sorting, through video instruction, building a learn about domino pair. Uh, for example, this goes with this. So here's the word smile. Let's listen to it on our talking card. Now let me find an appropriate picture of a presenter smiling, right? Um, so all of these things are extremely important. Before we move to diving in deeper, any comments about teaching vocabulary or do these skills make sense to explicitly teach? We good to keep going? Phil, I really like the way you talk about um, teaching specific skills and you've given us some examples that are that are really helpful, I think, in, in knowing what those skills might be. Um, there's so many times, I think, when we assume that because somebody has seen somebody else do a presentation, they know how to do it themselves, and, right. and um, especially with this population. Yeah. yeah. You know, Gail, it, it's so interesting because we have all used the strategy and instruction, I'm sure, where we will give a direction to a student and say, so could you tell me what I've asked you to do? Like meaning, demonstrate your understanding of that. And it is nowhere near what you ask them to do. And that is a really nice comprehension check, right? And that's what you're talking about is like, let's do comprehension checks and not assume that these kids know this from implicit observation as opposed to explicit teaching. 
And, and you know, I, I can't underestimate the power of coming to common understanding of what you mean, because the example I've given before is whenever I say to somebody, you need to listen. Okay, so my nephew, who is not a listener, okay, what does listening mean? It means you're making eye contact. It means this. So if you haven't established what you're looking for and what listening means, they could very well be listening, but the eye contact piece is something you're expecting, but they're not going to give because you never said you, that was a criteria. Right. And you know, Deb, I've seen so many times and it's because we have not spent time on this. So it was a lesson for me very early on in my career that when we have our users of AAC uh, devices or print-based supports for AAC uh, communication boards, for example, looking and searching, they need time to do that. And we need to train our audience that that's not a time for you to be talking about what you did over the weekend. That's a time for you to maintain your good listening skills and waiting skills to give that child time to generate what they need to generate. And so uh, that's very important when it relates to listening skills. Now, as we dive in deeper, I think that kids can't remember everything. We can't remember everything. Like in my own life, I call that noodles and not noodles. I'm Italian, so I always do these little examples that are food related. So the things that are noodles are the things that, okay, although I like thought it important, it's like not my top three today. It's like, I'm gonna let it go. But not noodles is, this is very important to me. And that's what I call this. What are the top things that you need to remember based on your student profile. And that may not be the same from one student to the next, but this is about giving information. So I like differentiating this in the way that our brain-based research says we should be differentiating. We need to teach things in threes, fives, sevens, and tens, okay? So what are your top three vocab skills that you are going to be teaching for oral presentation skills. And then if you're going to add more, go to five. So add two and then add another two and then add another three. And it's a nice bookend approach. Well, I like doing this with lists. And that's why in what I call the real world, which is where I think classrooms need to be making the linkage to, is all the time we see, what are the top five reasons you should do this? What are the top three things? And that's what this is. So the top three things to remember, top five, top seven, top 10 for being a speaker. Here's an example of one that uh, we had put together. Top three things to remember paired with a visual, use a voice loud enough for everyone to hear you. Speak clearly and pace your presentation, not too slow, not too fast, just right and smile at your audience. These were the top three. That's what we were looking for in our practice sessions. So this really worked because we didn't have to focus on all the skills, although we're learning all of these skills, but today this is what is not noodles, okay? So we do the same for audience members. Differentiate, threes, fives, sevens, and tens. Three things to remember, five things to remember, seven and 10, so that you will get as much information as possible. And here's an example. Keep your voice off and listen. Look at the speaker. Keep your body still and quiet. So it's very important to involve students in the creation of their resources. For those of you who have heard me speak before, it is critical for students to engage in the creation of their materials, not just to make your job easier, to give them the language experience so that it will better resonate and stick in their brain. They will have better retention of the content. And in this case, it is aligned to learning oral presentation skills. So here's a real life example from a kindergarten classroom. 
things were missing on the top three things to remember for speaker and listener. And I was modeling this lesson with the classroom teacher, with all students in the classroom, including our students with special needs. And students were helping create. And you could see here that they added some pictures. And then this was a talking chart. We, with a recordable pen, entered the information that was here and the students got to play it back and at the start of each lesson, there was a helper that did the speaker reminder list and the listener reminder list. But this tool was so much more meaningful for the students because they themselves participated in making it. Phil, may I make a comment? Um, the tool that you were showing uh, that you could use for the text out output is, uh, I believe it's the pin friend. That is correct. And I just wanted to make note that OTAP has a number of the pin friends in our loan library um, for checkout. So if you have someone who needs to have, or as a means of independence, um, can use that tool to hear, um, hear what's on the page, um, let me know and we can make sure you get one for trial with your students. Thank you, Deb. Thank you. So, this is another way that you could generate something. And you could see some similar things that are here, but this came not from starting with, these are the things that you need to do and to remember. And we started here. We didn't start here. We took a step back and said, let's teach the vocabulary first. Then we will put it in a list and demonstrate our skills. So you heard me mention before, and regardless of grade level, students have an easier time giving oral presentations if they are presenting on something they created in addition to wrote about. So you, they could have done, if it was a high school level, a research project, they could have done a photo journal of a field trip. They could have done something else that they've written about, but so much more meaningful if they pair that with an actual physical project. So that's what you are going to see next. And I'd like you to meet my friends, Moses, Lily, Josh, and Michael. And so all of these students have intellectual disabilities Moses also has an orthopedic impairment. Lily also has a mental illness. Josh is on the autism spectrum, as well as Michael. All of these students use AAC supports. Moses has an eye gaze system that he is learning to use right now and doing quite well. It is a Toby. Lily uses augmentative communication supports that are print-based to enhance her oral language and is doing beautifully with that approach. Once she acquires it, she's got it. And then we expand her language in another way. Josh is verbal, but has an AAC system. His AAC system is enhancing his oral language. Michael has vocalizations and uh, relies on his AAC system for intelligible speech. The strengths of all of these students are that they're excited to learn. In addition to that, they all benefit and show a, a positive response to structure and routine. In addition to they're eager to communicate. Their communication challenges are, and I'm gonna start over on the right here. Michael is always off topic. Josh is not a flexible thinker. Lily often will engage in language that is not grounded in reality due to her mental illness. So she can be off task within a lesson 
And Moses, although his typical day is smiling throughout his entire day, his biggest challenge is he has many surgeries throughout the year and medical appointments and misses a lot of school. That's our reality. So I wanted you to see some lessons related to involving this group of students and others as well in uh, this particular high school classroom uh, with teaching them executive functioning skills. So we were teaching them about their brain. And you could see I was doing this remotely. I also have been directly in their classroom. And they were going to be, as they were learning about their brain, creating a brain collage project. And so we shared with them to model executive functioning. These are all the materials you're going to need for your project. So I just have a little picture photo show of them putting this project together because this is going to be their oral presentation. So I just wanted you to see where we were going with this. So as you can see, uh, Moses is using his device to be able to make selections of different things that he is putting on his project. You will see what the final project is here, but basically it was to teach them that their brain is a filing system. And uh, I have had a significant amount of success and I'm uh, also launching on a research study for this as it ties to this type of teaching helps students with topic maintenance. So uh, these students across many high interest topics understood that their brain's a filing system. So they were going to put files onto their brain collage and then add listings of what goes in each of those files. So here is Moses doing that with his AAC device. Here is Michael. I also would like you to see here of, oh, this is our plan. What is our plan for the day? And this class called it our packed plan. Um, and so that was visible for all students. Also, students have checkoff lists here in terms of the step of our project. You can also see these folders are not, if you look at my video, a mess. Remember how I said, sometimes you have to teach what something isn't versus is. So we were organized. We taught organized means to put everything where it's supposed to go, not a big mess. And so the students loved that. So you could see here, they're starting to build their project. They also are illustrating and adding visuals to their project. Deb, you're probably seeing here these little white stickers that are on the folders because after a folder was completed, the students then with their voice, whether it was their AAC voice or in Lily's case with her natural speech, because she is a reader, would then record into the pen friend what the listings were in each of the folders. Here's an example of a folder, hobbies and things I like to do. What Lily is drawing right here is a pin cushion and sewing is one of the things that she likes to do. Other students didn't have the ability to do illustrations and they were cutting different pictures out as you could see here because cutting is also an OT goal for Josh. And Moses is very eager to share what he has generated on his device and also adding pictures. You're also going to see the pictures just don't stay floating on the outside of the brain. They are then connected with a choice of either pipe cleaners, so students could feel them, drawing lines with a Sharpie marker, using a wiki stick, whatever. You could see the pen friend is sitting here and Josh is using his device to say what he wants added and scribed onto his folder. So my point being that Josh will give a much better oral presentation because he is so actively involved in creating his project, which happens to be a learn about project because he was learning about his brain. I was there remotely and this is a strategy I'd love to share with you remotely that I am on a wheelie cart 
So Phil's on the computer right here and it's a snack cart and the laptop's on the snack cart. And you could see Josh is showing me exactly what he did. So he could see me close up in addition to seeing me up on the screen. And this little wheel fill around really worked and other uh, consultants in the program are also using this strategy now. You could see my uh, Moses also has a low-tech e-tran that he is using to be able to say, okay, which folder do I want to record next? Okay. And for a student who shows his excitement by body and movement, if you were to talk to Michael and say, Michael, you did such a great job adding that to your folder, he's gonna jump up out of his seat and run around the room. And then you're going to have to rein him back. Well, now he knows he needs to sit in his seat as a class member because we taught him that. So as students are using their devices to help create the project with the teacher, and you could see here we're on a little cart, this is what they ended up with. And what I love, love, love about this, everyone, it doesn't look like Martha Stewart did it. This is Michael's work, right? It's not perfect, it's his work and it's organized. And this tells you a lot about Michael's brain versus there's Josh's brain, very different profile of a kid, okay? What did I tell you about Josh? Not great with flexible thinking, but boy, is this kid organized, okay? And also visual spatial is really important for him. Here is Lily's. And Moses, unfortunately, was out for surgery again. So we don't have a picture of him holding his up, but we do have a picture of his finalized folder. As students were completing this project, they then worked their way through steps. Sometimes if students were off task, we would say, we're looking to get your initial up here to log that you've participated. And then they would share that with me as I was teaching this lesson with them. So students had printouts and they also had this on a piece of technology. Also for organization, every time that they completed a component of their project, they needed to put their picture up in their matrix. And Deb, this was a strategy we shared in our UDL series, a comparison matrix hunt. Um, so students- Very effective. Yeah, very effective. So you could see here, as students started completing, they would just sign up and say, I've done my, my folder. And so uh, they did some independent work and we did some group work on this. So now our students are ready to start building another presentation material. And they did this with guidance of what to put on each slide. So for example, they had a title slide and then they had to add their picture here. And you could do this using anything. You could use Google Slides, you can use PowerPoint, you could use, uh, oh, I'm spacing on the, the deck name. What is in Google? Something deck, I forget what is it's it called. Pear Deck? Yeah, Pear Deck, thank you. That, that was my, I'm almost 60 moment there. Um, thank you. And this example happened to come from the IPACT app system. But you can see this is where Michael put his stuff when creating this on an iPad. And this came from his device. So the recording right here, he recorded by hitting his display and adding the recording to this piece of technology. My name is Michael. My presentation is on my Learn About Brain project. We also offered different ways to do slide presentations. You could just have your picture here with a recording or you could even have some text over here. So we gave them what we called anchors for them creating their presentation let me tell you about my brain project. And then they would add their own picture and then add their own recording to it. Text to speech is the, is the thing that uh, was the playback here. And then in the center, 
Michael put his own picture here when building it and his message from his device that got recorded on this slide was here is my brain project and he has a touch chat that he's using. So my two favorite files were and he put my adult living goals and things I like to do. That's what he recorded here. This is a very simple presentation. The thing I like doing most was and Michael said, I like pictures. He just loved putting a collage of pictures onto his brain base collage. And then thank you for listening to my presentation was the way we decided to do a summarize and closing comment to start teaching them. And they got to pick out their thank you image from the web and then put whatever picture they wanted. And Michael's message was, which is so reflective of his personality, a big thank you. And he built that message on his device. So you could see here that the paras and instructional support staff are not doing this for the students. Lily's taking her own pictures of her project. She, just like Michael did, she's adding her own recordings. Now, Lily is doing that with her oral speech. Michael did it with his device, putting it in there. Bill, I like how you built in the reflection in some of your prompts to say, what is it that I liked the best? And to have them really think about the process. And it's, it, you know, now you know that pictures, and, and they probably already knew this, but the importance of pictures with that student is, uh, a way of engagement for whatever the topic is. I think that's um, yeah. self-reflection is, is the point. It's excellent. Yeah, thank you, Deb. And also it goes back to one of our vocabulary words we taught, your opinion. Share your opinion. What is it that you liked best? Because we would teach them all the time. Opinions are not right or wrong. They're what you think. It's about you. And then, and trust me, we have all had those moments in our career when we put our head down and go, why didn't I think of that, right? Why didn't I think of that? I remember when one student so many years ago in my career, and I've been in the field for going on 33 years now, but very early on, this student, we taught him oral presentation skills. He had three practice sessions. He nailed it out of the park, gave his oral presentation. And the teacher says, does anybody have any questions for Alex? And the special ed teacher and I looked and went, oh, we didn't prepare him to answer questions like that were spontaneous. And you could see he just froze up. I always say, I'm happy to go through the lesson once. One time I'll learn, but now I don't wanna make that mistake again. So I'd like to share with you the concept of a question bag. In some instances, and you're gonna see in the next upcoming slides, a closer explanation of this. Some students will, we come up with a question and then they generate an answer and we write that question on a card. We've pen friended it as well. And uh, if Mrs. Shepherdson in this case, who is the teacher says, does anybody have any questions for Josh? or for Moses or Lily or Michael. So say it was Josh's presentation, Josh would grab, kids would raise their hand and, or Michael would say, I have a question because he usually does it with his device. Josh would go over to Michael and say, pick a question. And so a question would come out of the bag. We know that Josh can answer the 10 questions that are in that bag, for example, whereas Michael might have three. And that's how we differentiated it. So finally, the day has arrived. We are beginning giving oral presentations. The big uh, part of this was students got to choose if they did it by themselves, standing up or sitting down or they wanted to pair with someone to have what we called a wingman, you know, there for support, or be like in a small group. So meaning sitting around like a table, even though they were socially distancing and putting like the desks together 
and doing it in a seated way. So we gave them choices for that. Every student chose to go to the front of the room, which I found very interesting, but very presentation areas. We also, of course, gave them the sentence starter options that were in their slide presentation, right? My favorite part of this project was dot, dot, dot. And also, we had some pre recorded message storage on their projects. All those folders, if somebody said, Oh, what is in your folder besides this that you just shared? That student could get a pen friend and easily just go through the list that they previously recorded. It's their voice, and they did it in terms of their prepping of presentation materials. The other piece is, is oftentimes you cannot always hear a communication device if it's in a gen ed classroom that is large or even now with social distancing. And so every student had their own Bluetooth speaker or a plug-in speaker to their device to make sure that they were loud enough that everyone could hear them. And of course, as you know, we did practice sessions on this. And they loved the practice sessions because one of the students, for example, Josh would come in with Michael and he would just look and go three, two, one, act. Ah! And that meant action. He could, he could never remember that word. So he loved using this. And so students were helping each other. So here is Lily giving her oral presentation and you could see she's shifting her focus from her slide presentation, which was projected projected behind her so everyone could see, but she's also showing her folder. She also then did walk around to the different students because they were spread apart. Joshua doing the same thing. I love this picture of Josh. Like, look just how cash he is. He wasn't nervous at all. And this is a kid that carries a lot of anxiety. And I just kept saying to him, so Josh, you've learned about oral presentations and he would go like thumbs up to me you've read about oral presentations and building your project now you've written your slideshow you've done your project are you feeling ready and he put two thumbs up to me he was just so excited i thought he was going to jump out of his skin and it's so nice to see this engagement in our learners the self-esteem phil i can almost hear uh, feel his pride Oh, my word, it does. It makes me very emotional when uh, I'm looking at this because, I mean, I was there for all of this. And when Michael said thank you, he felt he had to wave goodbye to everyone. And, and I think to me, because I was up close to be able to see him closely. Um, so I think that the best way to describe this in a layman way is these kids owned this. They were a part of every step of the process and it was so meaningful. And you might think, wow, how long did it take you to do that? And my response to that, not to be flip, is who cares how long it took? The outcome was we, these kids gave meaningful presentations. And, you know, of course it was over a series of weeks, but it certainly was not more than a month teaching them these oral presentation skills. And now they're going to embark on new projects that they're going to present on because now they've gone through the process of the routine. So here's that question bag I was telling you about. Mary Shepherdson came up with this question bag um, and she selected this visual you know, it's just a gift bag from the dollar store kind of thing. And she put a talk about on it uh, because this was a question answer period. And students had either on their devices or in their language system using their oral speech to say, pick a question. And this strategy works really well. I have had so many gen ed teachers that love this strategy that they're doing it with all kids. So write question and answers. You could also do it with a spinner. You could use any spinner, your smart board spinner, a spinner app. And we just put question marks on this, not to cue the student. The student had to listen to the question and then answer it. So instead of pick a question, spin a question. Students were very motivated with this. 
And then some students needed something a little more concrete with the pick a question and then uh, the answer was there, not for them to read, but for the student asking the question to make sure that they answered the question correctly because we didn't want the teacher kind of coming in uh, and doing that. Uh, so we tried to reduce uh, adult support here. And uh, this is another example of using the pen friend. Here's a question and an answer represented by a speech bubble. And uh, the answer was in the form of the message display with the symbol with text pairing, symbol with text pairing. So for example, if we were in science class doing something, it might say something like uh, about photosynthesis and it might uh, have make plants green. And they generated that on their device. So Phil, um, I also want to point out that I, I'm seeing what you're using with the uh, vinyl pouches and uh, oh. materials that now you put those dots on there. And so now you have a strategy that the kids recognize that's color coded red, so they know when it's going to be used. But you're also taking the old lesson topic out or questions out and just sliding something in new. Is that yeah, correct? that's correct. And you know, sometimes, as we know, things don't always happen the way we think they're going to happen in Oz, right? <laughs> so sometimes it's, uh, okay, we're going to get some questions together in the morning and we're going to practice them with the students because we really want them to participate in the afternoon because maybe the teacher didn't tell you this was going to happen in a timely way. And this, this just happens all the time in education. So you could use an expo marker or a wet erase type of marker and just write on the outside of the questions. So it's a real nice wipeable surface to Deb in, in the event you don't have time to like print something out, put it in the, the pouch or whatever. Well, and then the other point that that brings me to is that you could do it as the teacher or as an instructional assistant. Uh, once this process is known, anybody can do it and carry on uh, right. with the same process. Exactly, exactly. And these are such practical and inexpensive solutions. You brought up, Deb, the art of self-reflection, and you know I'm big into self-reflection. And so this was an example of Michael rating himself on his presentation. And you can see this happened March 8th, okay? So we have that he said he thought he spoke loud enough, he paced his presentation well. We had to adjust his uh, touch chat speed for that. He smiled at his audience. We discussed, how do you know someone's smiling or smiling under their mask? We said, they smile with their eyes and you see their cheeks go up. And so I had a mask on here in my office and I was leaning up and showing them. That's when we were teaching that in the Learn About module. And he also felt he looked at his listeners, which he did. He said he gained his attention and introduced himself by using his device and he stated his topic, which he did, and he shared his information, but he did not summarize at the end. We needed to prompt him to do that, to say thank you, because he was just so wicked excited that when he got to the end and people like started clapping for him, that was an example of the audience not waiting. He just was so excited. So. He was honest with himself and said, no, I didn't, I didn't do that. And then some of these skills uh, we did not teach. So we had said that we didn't work on that, Michael. But uh, this was a very meaningful way to teach the classroom teachers in this high school and middle school. It's a middle high school and said, these strategies are not special ed strategies. All education is special. And you hear me say that so often, Deb, that the same strategies that we use with sometimes our most intense needs students or those that have the greatest challenges, these research-based strategies really work with all the kids. And that's why it's so important to do and embrace that. And you can learn more about these strategies 
uh, in my new book, Every Child Can Learn. And I welcome you to explore that on Amazon. And uh, the short link is bit.ly Every Child Can Learn. And uh, you do not need a Kindle to read this. It's an ebook series. As long as you have the Kindle app, you can read it on your computer, your phone, your tablet. So, um, or if you do own a Kindle, of course, it would download to your Kindle. And this does relate to communication disorders uh, because you could see here that we came up and I'm very grateful uh, a bestseller in a variety of different educational categories. And one of them was communication disorders in special ed and in intellectual disabilities. So uh, there are many more strategies in that manuscript. So if that helps you, uh, that, would mean, that would make me feel good that it helps you. So you have such practical strategies. One of the, one of the challenges I think is uh, whether you're talking about in-person or virtual is taking those ideas that are so abstract such as universal design and, and you know, accessible. What does it mean to be accessible? Taking those ideas that can be abstract and making them real with step-by-step -step processes. And that's what exactly what you have given here for the creation and showing from the beginning to the end, um, uh, every step along the way that can be used and is now a roadmap for doing this with your, with your students. And I guess I just have to say, I love that. Oh, well, thank you, Deb. Yeah, it's, it's just been such meaningful work. And I think the reason it's been meaningful work is because now these students who have such challenges that sometimes I think we don't even realize each day what the challenge is, that they are having what I call a better presence of contribution. And that's what it's about. That's the definition of inclusion for me is presence of contribution. It's not just sitting there being a part of the class. It is being an active part of the class, like everyone else. Um, yeah, so that's a real feel good, right? It absolutely is, absolutely is. So we'll open it up to any other questions. I realize we're at the end of our time and, and such great strategies and ideas. Um, does anyone have questions or comments for Phil? You know, Phil, one of the things um, I'm a teacher by training, so one of the things I always think about is the collaboration between you and this classroom teacher in setting up this, this whole project and this whole unit. Um, I wonder, can you talk a little bit about how you two work together? Absolutely. Yes. Uh, so I work with the special educator, but also the different classroom teachers because these kids are in different grades. Um, so uh, usually I say, uh, who are you getting the most buy-in from? Oh, the English teacher's wonderful. Don't say anymore, we're consulting with the English teacher, right? <laughs> um, so I think that the road in is to show your kids have to do this anyway. Why? Because it's a speaking and listening standard, right? <laughs> so these are, the, these are the standards, these are the proficiencies that you need to have your students meet. And this is how we're going to go about customizing this for your students receiving specialized instruction. And I will tell you nine out of 10 time scale when I am meeting with a general ed teacher and share these strategies with the special educator there, that classroom teacher leans in in a wonderful way and goes, well, really, like all the kids could benefit from these reminders. That's the aha moment, right? And that's the road in is for what I think are related services and special ed, not doing something so diversely different than what would ever happen in the classroom is this can happen in the classroom. When that teacher saw the brain-based projects, she wants to do an executive functioning class and warm up every single day next year. And she wants to do this brain-based project. And I talked with her about many digital ways that kids could be doing this. And, uh, and so we're embarking on that next year in the collaborative way. 
And uh, that's a way to take a project that started in special ed and shared it out. No different than, oh, all kids or so-and-so needs a really big bookmark to be able to summarize the book that they read in fifth grade, right? And then we show what we're doing for Joshua and the teacher goes, I love this. I want all the kids to do this and we can hang them in the hallway. And I'm like, yes, you're right, me too. <laughs> so I don't, does that answer your question? Sure. That's, it wasn't the answer I expected, but it was a great answer. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> it, it's true. And, you know, I've always said uh, going over the years of, of working with assistive technology and supporting kids who might have challenges outside of uh, the, the bell curves um, was, first of all, the power of the routines. Um, and helping kids to learn and not just be one and done. And I know that's something that you like, but looking at processes so that um, I can now take away the cognitive load of having to figure out what you want me to do. Now I know it. And now I can spend my energy and my time on, um, on what it is you want me to learn instead. And so the whole piece about routines is we all thrive on that. And when we look about the places that we can make sure we're talking about inclusion, it can be through those routines um, because um, those are the pieces that ground and build foundation for your classroom. So I've got so many things and so many ideas that these bring about, but- um, yeah, Can I just add one other thing? Yeah, sure. It's, it's kind of a tag on to what Gail had asked me. Gail, I think that the other thing too, uh, is that it's important when a person like me or a special educator or a speech pathologist wants to connect with a gen ed teacher is to walk the walk and say, let me come in and teach your class. And I do that on a regular basis is to say, let me come in and model these strategies. And then you could be my wingman, right? Like you've got the content, but I'm coming in with the strategies. And when teachers see you walk into their classroom, and show how you can have meaningful inclusion, but how you can engage all the kids using the same strategy, that's the buy-in uh, that I think is the aha to, yeah, uh, one, this lady's for real, right? Because you, you have to walk the walk. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. And you have to shout out successes. And that's, the, I've always said, is the quickest way to systems change is uh, having everybody want to get on your bandwagon and um, strategies. Another thing I've always said is that things that start in the world of disability uh, often uh, do get accepted as mainstream. And that's what universal design is all about. You're showing me a better way. And whenever that teacher says, hey, can we try that? Then you know that you're making those connections, those dots, taking that abstract and making it real. So Phil, Thank you so much for sharing with us today. Um, it's always a pleasure to learn and grow. And, and any parting words from you, Gail? No, um, I was just going to say I have to go because I've got a meeting in 10 minutes in Virginia. So, <laughs> Okay, well, you head on off to Virginia. And thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. And the recording and handouts will be available to you all. Uh, Phil in Vermont. Uh, take care, everyone else. Thank you for all the things that you do. Phil, thanks so much. You're very welcome. Good to see you. Debbie. Thank you so much. Oh, Great you're stuff. so welcome.